I want to take you straight to what I think is the man's book of the Bible, and that's the book of Ecclesiastes. The book starts off in a kind of depressing way. Meaningless, meaningless, says the teacher. Utterly meaningless. Everything is meaningless. Um, sounds like a guy having a pretty bad day, and I, I guess you could assume that whoever wrote these words has got a pretty boring life. Maybe this is a guy that works in a factory somewhere putting widgets on top of gadgets. But that is not the case. The man who wrote these words was in fact King Solomon. He was the king over Israel at its greatest point in history. His father, King David, had lifted the warring and separated tribes into a bonded nation. And his son, King Solomon, was the cherry on the top of the cake. It would never be as good again for Israel as it was in Solomon's day. Well, what's his problem? The king of Israel, a, a man who's got the, the opportunity to do virtually anything he wants to do. Why is life so meaningless? Well, listen to the issues that kind of challenge this man's heart. In verse 4, you hear the first complaint. He says, generations come and generations go, but the earth remains forever. What's he saying? He's saying, my mortality is creeping up on me. Um, I may be the king and I may be in charge of everything, but I'm getting older, my body's getting frail, my hair's falling out. Uh, and the fact is, the, the buildings that I build are going to be around longer than I am. You know, one day they'll come and they'll say, I wonder who built this? Uh, and I'll be dead and I'll be gone. Fact is that a man's mortality begins to weigh upon him. I don't know if it's ever caught up with you, but I was about uh, 33 years old when I realised I wasn't going to be a teenager for very much longer. And that uh, life is moving in a relentlessly unhealthy direction. See, I used to have a grandfather. I don't have a grandfather anymore. I used to have a father. I don't have a father anymore. The reality is I'm next. And one of the things that weighs upon a man's heart is the sense of his own mortality, that life is drifting. And, and you, you ask yourself the question, is this all there is? I mean, is the life I'm living, is this a real life? Is this, is this all that life has? So here's uh, even a king disturbed over his own mortality. But then he goes on. Listen to his second complaint. He says this. The sun rises and the sun sets. And then it hurries back to where it rises. The wind blows to the south. And then it turns around to the north. Round and round it goes, ever returning on its course. The streams flow into the sea, yet the sea's never full. To the place where the streams come from, there they return again. All things are wearisome. More than one can say. You see, what he's talking about here is the ordinariness and the cyclical nature of life. The reality is that a lot of life is very ordinary. And you and I were created for heaven. Uh, you and I were created for a sense of life that kind of grips your soul and makes you know that, that everything's really happening for you. And yet, you wake in the morning, you eat your cornflakes, you get in your car, you drive through traffic, same traffic as yesterday, get to work, clock on, ding, you get to work for a few hours, they ring a bell, you get to drink a cup of coffee. Funny, did that yesterday. Work through to lunchtime. Um, open your lunchbox, what's in there? Peanut butter sandwiches. Funny I had peanut butter sandwiches yesterday. Well, you work right through the day, you drive home, you go home, watch the news. Same news as yesterday. What are we having for dinner tonight, sweetheart? We're having chops and peas. We had chops and peas last night. Yep, and you'll have them again tomorrow night too. You put your head down on the pillow, you wake up in the morning and it all starts again. Life is relentlessly cyclical in nature. A lot of life is ordinary and it begins to weigh upon a man's heart. Same wife, come on, the same house, same car. You, you pull the weeds out of the garden, the weeds grow back. You, you mow the lawn, the lawn grows back. You pay the bills and the bills come back. A lot of life is just cyclical and ordinary and it begins to weigh upon a man's heart. Is this all there is? Is this all my life adds up to? The fact is that these moments occur for every man. They occurred for King Solomon. And they're dangerous moments because in these moments a man begins to ask, uh, is there any way that I could spice up my life? You know, is there any way for me to break out of the ordinariness and maybe live the life I feel like I was always intended to live? Am I as happy as I'm supposed to be? 
Um, they are dangerous moments because in those moments a man begins to look around for alternatives. Happened to King Solomon. Listen to what he said. He said, uh, uh, I, I've thought to myself, I've grown and increased in wisdom more than anybody who's ruled over Jerusalem before me and, and, and I've experienced a lot of wisdom and a lot of knowledge so I applied myself to the understanding of wisdom and also of madness and folly. In other words, he says this, I'm the smartest guy in town. There's no one smarter than me. Now, what I ought to do is I ought to take all this wisdom of mine and kind of apply it to a man's life. In fact, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll turn my life into a research project. Um, I'll, I'll kind of experiment with life. And because I'm the smartest man in town, I'll write it down in a book. And then every man that follows me will be able to understand all it takes to have a fantastic life. Um, he's come to the point where he's prepared to experiment. Now that's chapter one. Now we come to the research project, we come to chapter two. And I'll tell you why these moments are so dangerous. It's because of the influence that a man has. It's not only your life that we're talking about. We're talking about the women and the children that look to you for leadership. Because you see, when a man starts to experiment with his life, the women and children that look to him for leadership find their life becomes a bit of an experiment as well. And so as we come to chapter two, we watch this great man of God begin to experiment with life. Well, what did he do? Well, first of all, he said, I'm going to give pleasure a go. Verse 1, I'm going to find out whether pleasure can make life worth living. Now, I don't know if you've ever done this. I've had a crack at a few of these things. I thought once that maybe skiing was the meaning of life. And then, of course, I took up golf and I thought maybe being a great golfer is the meaning of life. Um, I discovered something that... King Solomon discovered a long time before I did that when a man begins to make pleasure the meaning of his life, he starts investing time and money in something that he often really doesn't have the capacity to pursue and even if he gives it everything he's got. Listen to the conclusion. He said this, it proved to be meaningless. So after he, you've invested your money and your time and your energies into this hobby, or into this sport, or into this pursuit, this pleasure, you thought was really going to make life worth living. You've emptied a bank account, uh, you've maybe fractured a few relationships, and all you've discovered is that pleasure is not the meaning of life. Well, he said, I pressed on. He said, I, I gave laughter a go. Then he did the Australian thing. Uh, it says here, I tried cheering myself with wine and embracing folly. My mind was still guiding me with wisdom, I wanted to see what was worthwhile for men to do under heaven during the few days of their lives. You know what he did? He hit the booze. Now, in Australia today, there'll be men all over the country will be going to bottle shops and buying their cases of Carlton Draft or 4X, and they're totally convinced that you may not be able to drown your sorrows, mate, but you can sure make them swim for it. And they'll be hitting the bottle uh, all through the night, just trying to somehow escape the ordinariness or the, the normality, the cyclical nature of their life. But you know what? They'll wake up tomorrow morning and maybe they will have done things that they deeply regret and there'll be women and children looking to them for a better way of life. Now you follow Solomon. He said, I gave pleasure a go. I tried laughter. I hit the booze. I gave drugs a run. Then he says, I undertook great projects. I, I did a man's thing, you know. I, I took on a really big challenge. I thought, I'll build a big business. Maybe big business is the meaning of life. You know, I'll invest myself in that. Or maybe I'll build a house, a wonderful house. He said, I built houses and I planted vineyards. I made gardens and parks. I even put a pool in the backyard. Reservoirs to water groves of flourishing trees. He said, I bought male and female slaves. I own more herds and flocks. I amassed silver and gold for myself. And then the treasure of kings and provinces. We had a businessman here in Australia that kind of gave us a picture of what the, the grand Australian businessman might look like, Alan Bond, during the 1980s, you know, acquiring businesses, accumulating money, uh, doing the uh, America's Cup thing. Didn't turn out well for Al, ended up spending some time behind bars. The fact is that when men go on a search to try to make life exciting, it gets a little dangerous, not only for themselves, but also for the women and children that look to them for leadership. 
He pressed on. He said, I acquired men and women singers. And then the big one, sex. It says right here, and I acquired a harem as well. Nobody went after sex like King Solomon did. In fact, I have no idea where he found energy for a, a thousand women in his life. But you see, the problem, of course, with sex is that sex gives you the access to one of the most potent chemistry sets in your head. And that's what the whole Valiant Man program's about. The fact that men are just trying to find an exciting way to do life. And sex gives them one of the most potent uh, avenues to escape from feeling ordinary to feeling normal and having the big hit, you know, the thrilling moment that'll really make my life worthwhile. Well, we could take time unpacking all of this, but why don't we get down to the bottom line? I want to say to you, the best teacher in life is not experience. The best teacher in life is the idiot who did it five minutes before you were thinking of doing it. He's the guy you want to talk to because often experience extracts from you a price tag you cannot afford to pay. And after all of this experimentation with the ordinariness of his life, trying to crack the code, trying to find the meaning of life, listen to someone who did it before you did. The Bible says, I denied myself nothing my eyes desired and I refused my heart no pleasure. And yet, when I had surveyed all that my hands had done and what I had toiled to achieve, everything was meaningless. And you come down a few more verses and listen to his testimony. So I hated my life. You know, one of the scary things is this. When a man starts hating his life, the women and children that look to him for leadership get to hate their lives as well. And this is what makes my dad perhaps the greatest hero in my life. You see, my dad must have wrestled with all the ordinariness of life. His same home for 40 years, the same wife for his lifetime, same kids, same bills, same garden, same weed, same problems. And yet I never saw my father act out like this. I never came home to find my mother crying because dad was down the pub trying to drown his sorrow. I never came home to find my mum crying because dad had emptied the bank account trying to buy himself some new thrilling project to make his life interesting. I watched my father live a life of sacrifice. He served my mother, he loved my mother, and he served me and my household all the days of my life. One of the reasons I'm still married and in love with my wife and I'm still walking in a straight line is because I had a father who demonstrated to me what it means for a man to embrace his responsibilities, to face his challenges like a man and just walk straight and true all the days of his life. Let me take you to the very end of the book and we'll sum this thing up. Well, Al, what is the meaning of life? Al, you, if, if chasing pleasure and booze and, and all that other stuff, if that's not the meaning of life, what is the meaning of life? Well, listen to what the Bible says. Now everything has been heard and here is the conclusion of the matter. Fear God and keep his commandments for this is the whole duty of man. For God will bring every deed into judgment, including every hidden thing, whether it is good or evil. One of the greatest challenges that a man faces in this life is to face the cyclical nature, what's often camel travel in his life, the, the ordinariness of life, and face it like a man of God. To recognize that you and I are simply not here to thrill ourselves. We're here to serve our God. We're here to serve our community. We're here to serve our wives and our children. We're here to serve the purposes of Jesus Christ in this earth. And I want to tell you, you'll never find a greater life. And at the end of it all, life is like a twinkling of an eye. It's just a, a, a brief vapor and it's gone. And in just a few short years from now, who knows, days or even hours, you could be standing in the presence of God. And there's one thing you want to hear. Well done, good and faithful servant. Eternity stretches out before you. Don't blow eternity in a flurry of, of self-indulgence and, and, and wasted time and wasted moments. Love people. Love God. Love your wife. Love your kids. Love your church. Love your nation. And the fact is you'll live a life that's truly worthy of any man. God bless you.